Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 177, getting started with D&D, a comparison of D&D starter sets to start you down the path. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So tonight we've got a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons whose daughter is looking to get into 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. So what we're going to do tonight is break down the various different Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition starter sets that are out there so that they can make an informed choice. After that, we've got a board game expansion review, and I'll be, we'll be looking at the Command Station expansion for Space Base. We wrap up with our usual week in review with the most casual game of Scythe ever and some For the Queen. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a quick comment on our topic of players missing game night. Frank Bartlett says, skip a week. If they are in a city, do some RP that won't impact the party as a whole. Good suggestion, Frank. Though I do say if you do skip a week, you should still try to do something with the rest of the group. Just whatever it happens to be, whether it's you eat, you hang out, you you do some kind of other type of gaming or something. The whole reason is so you keep the game night regular. You want it to be, say, every second Tuesday you get together. And if it becomes that way, it becomes something you can pre-plan and something people can count on and they can put in their date books and their calendars. And that way, whether you play or not, you're still getting together and you still have the night set aside. Because I find as soon as you start letting it slip, after like one week, you're usually probably good. But once it's like two weeks, someone cancels. Then the third week, you suddenly have two people canceling because they didn't they get the whole, oh, I didn't know we were playing tonight. And it becomes a mess. So my recommendation is to still get together somehow, even if that's just like a watch party on Zoom or something, watching something on Netflix. Just keep that block of time still set aside for gaming. Yeah. Well, next we have another quick comment, this time from Pickpocket Press RPG Videos, who commented on our talk about crowdfunding red and green flags to say, nice vid, thanks for the insights, lads. Well, you're welcome. I got to say, this one's proved to be pretty popular. Uh, there's actually quite a few discussions online about this one going on. It just, there's too much. They were too involved for a short little segment like this to really talk about here. But there are definitely a lot of people, we have been contacted by a lot of crowdfunding project creators to say, or or people thinking about launching a crowdfunding project to say they really appreciated the discussion. So I'm really happy about that because that's what we're here for and seeing that it's getting out there and people are getting some useful information from it is fantastic. All right. Well, next up, longtime fan of the show, Red Meeple Ryan, had this to say about our space-based command station unboxing video. That command station comes with a large pack of sleeves, or that the command station comes with a large pack of sleeves, is the thing I'd been missing when trying to research it and justify paying out that much for a box, insert, dice, and stuff for two more players I may never use. I hope they're less slippery than Sleeve Kings. Well, this comment right here is one of the main reasons I wanted to do up a formal review of the command station, which we are going to be doing later on tonight in the show. Because it seems like a lot of people are confused as to exactly what you get in this box and what it adds to space space. And I want to clear some of that up today. Well, for our last comment tonight, Mike Z has some thoughts on our ugly games that play great article. I can accept dominant species. It is a usable interface and I like the minimalist style. The cover is ridiculous and totally needs a new <laughs> look. Even dominant species marine looks better. I'll also add Medici to the list. It's had several re-releases with each iteration being just as hideous as the last, but it is such a fun auction game that I'll always be willing to play it. Acquire is another one you can put on that list. Like yep. a bleak bingo card, the board slowly gets built out until companies are fed to other companies. Cutthroat at times and always a question as to who is winning, it is so much better than its boring look. Some great ugly games there, Mike. I am with you, though. Dominant Species is... is uh, sorry, I'm with you. Though Dominant Species is at least functional. 
even if it is really drab. So fair enough. I just wish it looked cooler. And I've got to say the number of people who have mods out for that game, I think, is a good indication of how much you can use it. Uh, now, Majichi, you talking about that does remind me a lot of Castles of Burgundy. Um, we're going to release the anniversary edition, and it, I think all they did was turn up the contrast a bit. That's about it. Um, though that's finally getting an actual real graphical update with the new edition coming out of GameFound, which just like funded ridiculously well not too long ago. Uh, plus, there's going to be like a 3D tile version if you really want to go that far. But even just the basic tiles do look significantly better. Now, Acquire is one I hadn't thought of at all, but it is so true. Now, I could say my copy is from the 1960s. And the fact it even has plastic tiles in it is impressive. So for 1960s board games, when you compare it to what else is out there and other Sid's action games, it really doesn't look that bad. But there is no reason that modern versions of Acquire should still look the same or worse, because in the most recent editions, they even replace the plastic tiles with cardboard chits. I, how can this game get worse looking after 58 years? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop patron Kevin Renault, who asks, My daughter is looking to get into Dungeons & Dragons, and she is looking at the starter set that everyone seems to sell for around 20 bucks. <laughs> I don't know if this would be a wise investment or not. Where would you suggest she start? Well, thanks for the great question, Kevin, and for supporting us through our Patreon. Now, I have to start by saying I really wish Kevin didn't have to ask this question. Like, to me, in an ideal world, if you wanted to get into Dungeons & Dragons, there'd be one place to go. There'd be one core product out there that's meant to be the gateway for all gamers looking to get into the fifth edition of this rather classic but very well-loved game. But that's not the case, unfortunately. And even if you Google the words, how do I get into Dungeons Dragons? How, what should I start with in Dungeons Dragons? You're going to get different answers from Wizards of the Coast. So instead of having one clear answer, as of right now, there are four different Dungeons and Dragons starter sets on the market right now available. Four totally different entry points and a new one coming next month. Now, having delved through certain portions of the website, I would say that Wizards at least thinks it does have a solid and understandable plan for what they think all these products are for. Unfortunately, sure. the lines of communication are solidly out of whack and certain naming conventions could probably be revisited. Yeah, I would say at this point, they think they have one gateway point. And I've got to admit, the one they think is right is probably the one you would guess just looking by names, but still. It is a mess because working on this, both Sean and I found two completely different pages that were called Getting Started with Dungeons and Dragons. These are both on Wizards main website for D&D, and they both suggested two totally different places to start reading. Yeah, the fact that both Google and their own different and their own drop down menus seem to offer differing advice mm -hmm. was a truly bizarre experience that Mo and I tried to try and yes. we, we realized we were both talking about the same page, except it wasn't the same page. It was mm -hmm. called the same thing, but it was actually in different subdirectories. Yes. Basically, I, I worked on the article and I put it down and Sean's like, what are you talking about? They have a very clear direction that tells you to go here. And I'm like, well, here's a page that tells you to go here or here and maybe here, which it started looking the same, like, 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 ah. yeah. Now, what baffles me even more with all these products and that would clear things up, though might be a little frustrating, is that they're all still in print and readily available. Like, you can find these online and in local game stores, on shelves, bookstores, Toys R Us here in Canada. You can still buy these products and they're available. I would think that if you had and wanted a flagship onboarding product, there would be one. And if you ever decide that flagship onboarding product is no longer the perfect starting point, you would discontinue that and release a new one. But I'm not Hasbro, so what do I know? So what seems to be the root of the problem is actually the design and indexing of Wizards own dnd.wizards.com. Uh, what they want you to see and what Google offers to some people searching are different. 
And if I were a betting man, I would put my money on Google over Wizards for who's going to choose who sees what. Yeah. Like, I, I, the first thing I did when starting research on this project, even though I know what options are out there, I am aware of the different starter sets and kind of who they're aimed at. I Googled where to start with D&D because I wanted to know who, what someone else would see. And I was even smart enough to do this in incognito mode because me searching that is going to be very different from someone just off the street searching that. But the top hit was a blog article. And the blog article was very clear, but it wasn't from Wizards of the Coast, right? So I didn't want to just take this blog article. The second was a page on Wizards of the Coast that told me exactly where to start. But it's an old page, and it doesn't match where they want you to start now. Well, thanks to the personalized results one gets from Google, I got a different result and ended up on what I believe to be the page Wizards expects complete noobs to start on. So we could be completely wrong here, and maybe there's a third page out there that they really do think we should be looking at. But anyway, uh, enough trying to figure out what Wizards of the Coast thinks their gateway D&D product is and what they're telling the public their D&D gateway product is. Let's talk about what we think is the proper entry point to the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, in order to keep uh, to help Kevin and his daughter out, what we're going to do is break down exactly what you get in each of the existing starter sets, as well as a little bit of a discussion on each to look at like um, what what you get, the player count, the amount of game, how much gameplay. And we're also going to talk about the new one that has been announced that releases next month, because depending on how long Kevin's daughter is willing to wait, it might be worth waiting for that, though. I don't know. All right. Well, first up, we have the D&D starter set. Now, this was first released yes, in 2014 with an MSRP of 1999 US, which dropped in 2019 to 1799. This is ideal for a group of four to six, and it includes a 64 page adventure book, The Lost mm -hmm. Minds of Fandelver, with everything the dungeon master needs to get started. It also has a 32 page rule book for playing characters levels one to five with five pre-generated characters and character sheets, and six dice. So this was the gateway. This was the very clear and obvious gateway for five years. This was the only D&D starter set box set out there until 2019. This was the go-to. This is what I own, as you can see behind me here. Um, this is considered by many experienced role-playing game fans and Dungeons & Dragons players to be one of the best starter sets out there on the market from any game. The Adventure, The Lost Minds of Fandelver, is, has a reputation almost at the level of like The Enemy Within or Orient Express for Call of Cthulhu. It is a really popular, well-regarded adventure. It is also very long which is surprising for a beginner box. Now, I will admit this is a traditional adventure. It's, it's trying to introduce you to the D&D &D world, and it's fairly linear, right? It's going to slowly introduce rules. It's going to slowly introduce things, and you're going to learn the game as you play. But it is going to take you multiple sessions to complete. Like maybe if you're doing an Extra Life marathon, you may be able to play all of Fandelver in one setting. Um, I bet you if you Google it, someone's done it. But this is actually a short campaign. And for anyone who knows anything about role-playing, you are going to start at level one, and at the end of the adventure, you will reach level five. Yeah, and this campaign is very well laid out in the way that they sort of rolled out the, the types of challenges players can encounter mm -hmm. along the way. Uh, in, your, in the chapter, it's a four-chapter adventure, and in chapter one, you're going to run into uh, some goblins and some traps. And then in level three, in chapter two, you're going to get run into some more complex things. And they have really, I mean, while it is, yes, a bit of a railroad adventure, it's designed to onboard you. So it's mm -hmm. very well specifically designed to railroad you through the ups and downs and, and curves of a DD and d campaign. Now, one thing that's important here for many gamers is it is pre-generated characters. There is no character creation available in this starter set if you well until 2019 if you wanted to make a character for DD, you would have to either go get the basic rules or go into like buying the player's handbook now one thing i do like about this adventure that i think is good is it's set in the forgotten realms 
which nowadays that is the default setting for Dungeons and Dragons. And you're not on some strange world or some place that's out of pulled out of the out of the, the, the overall background of Dungeons and Dragons. So it's easy to finish this adventure and continue on. You're just you're in the realms. Let's keep playing more in the realms. Now, the other nice thing is that they have hooked the pregens into the campaign. So there yes. are NPC hooks and things designed into these characters. So if you so while you could play this character with other uh, uh, could play this campaign with other characters, if you had the other books, uh, you'd lose a little bit because yeah. you wouldn't have those built in connections. Which personally, I think is a bit of a drawback because people like to play their own characters. Uh, one thing I did notice is they didn't name the character. So that was a nice touch. I didn't notice if there were more details. I did look through mine. And as I mentioned already, this is one of the best adventures out there. For I, I'll admit, I haven't played it. This is this is based on on <laughs> surprising amount of time of research into it and looking through my own copy. Um, like people have told me, like like if you're experienced D group, play that adventure. So this is really what wizards want: non RPGers who want to become RPGers to start with. This is their ideal first step on the path to becoming a full-time real D&D player. Now, for now, because in 40 days time, that point's about to shift to a new Target exclusive starter set. So right now, this seems to be as far as we can tell where Wizards of the Coast wants you to start. But they're about to put out something new which we'll get to in a bit. Right. And uh, that's a Target exclusive until October. Yeah. All right. Next up, we've got so the D&D &D Essentials Kit. This was first released in 2019. It's got an MSRP a little higher of $24.95 US. This box contains the essentials you need to run a D&D &D game with one Dungeon Master and, impressively, from one to five yes. adventurers. That one's big, right there. This comes with a rule book, a Dragon of Ice Spire peak introductory adventure, six blank character sheets, mm -hmm. 11 dice, a 33 inches by eight and a half inch dungeon master screen, 81 cards for magic items, sidekicks, and more, as well as a 21 inch by 15 inch double sided poster map for use with the adventure. And note the poster map is gridded because one of the things you can do in Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition is tactical inch by inch combat. Note can do. So first off, very obviously, way more stuff, which justifies that price point, I think, pretty well, like, like ridiculously yep. well. Now, interestingly, the day this released is when the other one dropped in price. And I don't know if they felt like it didn't have as much value or if they wanted people to be like, well, obviously, that's the one I start with because it's cheaper. And I get a real D&D, AD&D vibe out of these two kits at that point. A little bit, yeah. I I mean, again, the, 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 the difference in character creation uh, yeah. is, is a huge one. And then the one-on-one -on -one rules. So the, mm -hmm. the two biggest sort of differing uh, aspects between this and the starter set are those, are those two things. One you can play one-on-one, -on -one, which for some groups or some families may be the choosing, you know, if it's just you and your brother or you and your sister who want to play D and D you're going to, you have to start with the essentials mm -hmm. kit. Um, but then well, the no, you could play the original and play more than one character. That's always been an option with Dungeons and Dragons. True. It's never been the best option. Yeah, but... I, I, th that to me that I don't consider that an option personally. <laughs> I don't like multi-charactering. RPGs, and I think as a, as an experience for a new player, that's probably not ideal. Yeah, I uh, admit. But so uh, then again, and then character cre creation is the big yes. step up from that. That is a huge game. thing. That that alone could be a deciding point, as far as I'm concerned. There are a lot of people that don't like playing pre generated characters. So interestingly, there is a brand new rule for Dungeons and Dragons introduced in this set, and it is considered a core rule. So even people who own the PHB Dungeon Master's Guide and Monster Manual may have wanted to pick this up. And that is the rules for sidekicks. That is how the one-on-one -on -one rule variant works. 
is you technically are playing more than one character because you get your character and a number of sidekicks to be able to complete the adventure. I don't own this, so I don't know how those work, and I don't know how, like, to me, it just sounds like we're talking about henchmen going back to the old D&D days, but from what I understand, it's more like a power you can use, but it represents another character being there. Interesting. Again, just doing some research. So again, I think you're stuck with that, even playing one-on-one. There are multiple characters present, but I don't know if it ever calls on you to role-play more than one character. Right. That's fair. Uh, I think the fact that you're getting a DM screen and you get additional dice mm-hmm. and a map to give you the tac- the ability to start playing tactical uh, are big deals. Yeah, no, they are. Now, as for the adventure, this is a totally different style of adventure. This is a timeline-based sandbox-style adventure where you are presented with a map and a world and tell the players to go. Yes, there is an ongoing story. There are going to be story beats. But, like, you're basically switching from your old-school Eye of the Beholder, Baldur's Gate game. Now you're playing your, your you know, Zelda... I, I'm totally drawn a blank on the name of the latest Zelda game, the popular one, or whatever, Grand Theft Auto, though that's totally not the end of your fantasy. Wild. Breath of the Wild, yeah, thank you. It's sandbox style, right? It's You're going to go to different places and have different experiences, and both the Game Master is presented with more options, and the players have more freedom. This is going to play more like a homebrew campaign, a, a the DM improvising, making stuff off the top of their head, with guidelines so one of the things i ran into researching the the adventure from this module or from this from this set was they don't actually follow sort of their own best practices for first level characters so first level characters in DD are squishy <laughs> they get mashed really easily um now i it, i've never played 5e so it's it's not quite as bad as it used to be but they're more squishy than fourth right because i i mean i want i i see i remember that a d12 was the most hit points any character could ever get in in yeah. uh in things whereas they actually there is actually in level one in chapter one of this adventure there is a cr3 manticore that can do 21 points of damage now, from what I understand, this is in result of people wanting more of that old school feel where every fight shouldn't be that your characters can just there to be beat. Right. This is to this. Uh, to me, that's part of sandbox play. That's that's part of your hex crawl. That's part of your adventure is sometimes you go places you probably shouldn't have went. And I think that's what they were trying to get across. And yes, some groups did not like that. And, and, and see, I I get that in a general sense. But first level in D&D yeah. is an exception. Uh, first level, again, your characters are squishy. Your characters <laughs> are going to die really easily. So th- they should have the ability to enjoy leveling up before they have the complete yeah. risk of being massacred. Um, and, and this, it feels a little on the tougher side uh, based on the reading I was doing for this particular adventure. Now, interestingly, you're talking about leveling up. In this one, instead of level one to five, you can go one to six. I have no idea what the difference is between five and six in the current edition of D&D, but that's one more level, right? So you would think more you can get out of this. Now, this is a quote from the Wizard of the Coast website, because everything up to this point, to me, sounds like an alternate starting spot. Whereas they called this, this is this is on the box, take your first step into the world of Dungeons and Dragons, or get a more expansive D&D experience after playing the starter set. So they're setting it up as a play after the starter set. Or your first step. So even there, like their their messaging is confusing. Again, I get a very basic D&D, AD&D vibe going on here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so for me, this is a really sort of, this is your next step after starter for most people, unless you have a experienced DM. If you right. have an experienced DM, I think essentials might be the better starter place. Uh, so starter, the starter uh, set, the starter box set, if everyone's new, if only the players are new uh, and your DM has a little bit of experience, the essentials mm-hmm. may be your easier start. That being said, I think Mo and I both agree that there's nothing wrong with having all the stuff from both these sets. I agree. And it's a good price to be able to have everything mm-hmm. you get in both. Yeah. So a couple other notes about it is this is also in the Forgotten Realms. Um, and to be honest, the two adventures are, I don't know how exactly, but they're tied together. 
Like there, there is a, you can tell they're in the same world. Um, there are many people that consider this the ideal second purchase for new players who have bought the starter set. Cause again, you're going to be able to create characters yep. and you're going to go from level one to six. And the dungeon master role is more, fleshed out being a true dm instead of just reading box text right. right you're not you're not just driving the railroad down the track you're actually able to come up with decisions that impact the play and your character the characters yeah. playing with you so that was unless you have more to add the nope. D essentials kit right now next up is where we start to get into some of the naming problems yes so our next up is the 2019 Stranger Things D&D Starter Set. This has an MSRP of $24.99. The Stranger Things Dungeons & Dragons Starter Set contains everything players need to embark on a Stranger Things adventure, including the essential rules of the role-playing game. It is a great new way, a great way for new as well as seasoned Dungeons and Dragons players to experience the D&D adventure Stranger Things character Mike Wheeler has created for his friends. And that's a quote from uh, yeah, that's, from that's the back of the box, basically. Yeah. So this one has your adventure book. It has a rule book. It's got five character pre-generated characters with their own character sheets, six dice, two Demogorgon figures, one pre-painted and one unpainted and primed ready to paint which i there's a scene in stranger things where mike's painting right is that why so they threw apparently these are actually squishy ish plastic oh, the, the, and like they're horrible to paint um so it's 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 I'm really sure kind it's of standard pre-paint <laughs> plastic which is, is uh honestly and uh, also plastic. to note the the stra- the character sheets the pre-gen characters are the characters played by the yes. kids in the TV show. Mm-hmm. So that's just... And I will say the look of this is fantastic. It looks like Mike's notebook, right? And and, and the character sheets are scribbled on. And it the, there's a lot of physicality and artifacts in this that I think is really cool. If you told me that this wasn't 5e, that this was a AD&D, you know, oh. Redbox uh, or, or Redbox yep. edition... I would have believed you because that's yes. what they've done. They've given it the red box treatment. Specifically the red box treatment. Yes, that's they made absolutely. it look like the red box. Yep. So this is a D&D starter set. Like it's they say it right there. It's a great way for new D&D players and it gives you all the rules. You literally have the D&D basic rules, pre-gen, start at level 1, blah blah blah, except you don't. Um this isn't just a Stranger Things adventure. You don't need anything else but this box, and it's meant to be a gateway to D&D for people who bought into Stranger Things on Netflix. The adventure is the adventure that Mike wrote for, you know, Mike, quote-unquote, Mike wrote for his yep. players. Uh, so, again, I, I'm not clear that this is in any way related to uh, the D&D for, uh, Forgotten Realms. I don't know on that one. Sorry, uh, that's not. I wasn't. I, was able, able I wasn't able out. to find that out myself. Yeah. Uh, I, but... w- I would. It could be based on on on. Well, the demon gorgon is a demon that's in. in I think it was Greyhawk. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I honestly, <laughs> don't know on that one. I I think it's probably in Mike's own world. Is my guess. I bet you it's Mike's cities. And I suspect so, on. so. Yeah. I, again, there's um, not a lot to it. <laughs> no. I, so you get pre-gens, pretty expected, right? No character generation whatsoever. Um, the adventure, though, surprisingly, is written for an experienced DM. It is an improv heavy, here's some guidelines, run with it style of adventure, which to me does not belong in anything called starter set. What also goes with this is that the pregens are level three. Level three in D&D is like our level four in Charterstone, our fourth game. Like level three is when you start getting the fireballs right. and suddenly you have all these new options. And in a way, it's cool because honestly, it's level three in D&D can be way more fun than level one in D&D. So I get that, but it's so odd for something called the starter set. Yeah, and, and again, to me, I think this product is actually really fantastic. If they had ex- excluded the words starter set uh i think this product is fantastic yeah the problem is it's it's the they needed to get across the fact that it's all you need to play 
right. that you don't need the player's handbook. You don't need the Dungeon Master guy. You don't even need to know anything about D&D 5e and you can play this. How do you do that without saying starter set? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure... There I'm are sure terms, there were marketing experts. Yeah, here. there are terms you could use, but the problem is uh, they aren't terms that D&D uses for other products, and I'm sure right. they wanted to keep their branding consistent. Yeah. Um, so for me, this is not for starting out in D&D. It's for playing Stranger Things D&D, specifically playing the game that they are playing in the TV show yeah. as the characters from the TV show. The uh, weird part there, just an odd thing about this, why didn't they give you an original Demon Gorgon mini then? The Grenadier Sculpt. Because right. if you were going to play the D&D game, the Demon Gorgon doesn't look like um, a, a Audrey 2 <laughs> or what, whatever's going on there. Yeah. Now, complaints I have seen about this one. The adventure is very short. Um, barely enough to fill a long evening. Probably a little too short to split it in two, but you kind of don't want to put it all in one, like two max or three, because this is highly improv. If you're going to do lots of role playing, especially as a Stranger Thing characters and, you know, waste time playing Stranger Things like I, you got you a dream part going on here. You're going to be playing a character, playing a character. If you go into that whole thing, you could possibly stretch it out. Um, your characters do level up from level three to four, but there aren't all the rules for leveling up to level four. There's something very specific about a subclass that's completely skipped at level four, which D&D fans were upset about. And I'm kind of with Sean. Like, like to me, this is a one shot. This is this is something I go and I pick up and I run it on Halloween or I play it with my friends who are into um, Stranger Things or I run it at a con or at a, uh, a, a local game store. Right. Like like free RPG days this weekend. Like, go run this at Free RPG Day as an intro to D&D. Like, hey, you haven't played D&D, come play this. Maybe then you might want to pick up the books from the shelf over there. But, like, I can't see this as your intro to D&D. Like, yeah. it could be someone's intro yep. to D&D. I get, I think, and I think you nailed it right there. I think this would be a great con or demo game to bring in a new player with where you've got a GM who really knows this adventure and knows stranger things really well and knows how to work a group to bring inexperienced players into the world and let yeah. them have fun. Uh, because again, you do get way more sort of meat to a character as a level three character mm -hmm. than you do starting off as level one. But it's not something I would want to play with a fixed group that I was going to be going doing anything long term with necessarily, yeah. unless I we all said, hey, you guys want to do a Halloween adventure or, a con or you know, do do a one shot. We're going to pick this up and do it. But even then, uh, as a one shot uh, at twenty five bucks or no, twenty not twenty five. This one's only no, yeah, twenty five 25. bucks. Yeah, twenty five bucks US for what you get in this, especially considering the minis are of question questionable quality. I it's a hard buy it you know some i could see someone you getting this for someone who's a stranger things fan getting it for a christmas gift mm -hmm. and then maybe you do the one shot but mm -hmm. i i have would have a hard time imagining going out and buying this myself and there's some like i said befuddling stuff like uh, for one you get two demon gordon miniatures that don't look like demon gordon from the series but no minis for the characters or anyone else like like why do i get just the boss monster i i i, I find this product confusing uh, we do have a question from the chat asking about Elmore art. Um, I don't think Elmore did this cover, but it's a very Stranger Things cover. Um, it doesn't quite have the old school look. It's it's like the cover's got the old school. I don't know. It's It looks too modern to me, but I think it looks like Stranger Things. Right. I think they did. I, I don't know. This this is, a to me, a fascinating project product, and I think it's really neat that it exists. And I have to admit, like, if we got the right group of players together, I would love to run this and play it. Oh, yeah. But I can't recommend this one. Uh, like this is the, again, it's the thing to trick Stranger Things fans. It, it's a way to show them how simple D and D is. Everyone thinks D and D is a ton of math and complicated. Here's a way to trick your friends who like Stranger Things to be like, look, this is actually fun, and it's not all just spreadsheets. This is not if someone's like, hey, I want to learn about D and D. No, this is for people who are like, oh, they, they, there's this game they play in there that looks like fun. I'm like, hey, I got this box. You want to try it out? We can play the game they were playing. Yeah, it's it's weird. I it really does sort of seem like a a you know dangly piece of bait swinging in front of Stranger Things fans who don't know any role players. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's kind of how it feels to me, and and that 
it you know, feels a little dirty in that way. Again, the naming of this kit is what completely throws me off. I still don't know what else you'd name it, though. I, that's that's the part I'm stuck on. Is I'm like, I don't know what else you call it. A Stranger Thing adventure to me implies you need to have the the rest of the rules. I mean, I don't I, know. Stranger no, Things shouldn't have put D and D on the box. Just put Stranger mm. Things role playing. Or the Stranger something. Things adventure kit brought to you by D and D adventure kit. Yeah. Uh, you know. Anyway. Yep. Enough about enough about the upside down. All right, moving on. So our next product is again from 2019. This is Dungeons and Dragons versus Rick and Morty, a tabletop role playing game adventure. Now, despite being called adventure, this is an intro box again that includes all the rules you need to play and could work as an introduction to D and D. This has everything you need to play in one box again. You don't have to go out and buy anything else. So from the box, D&D has partnered with Adult Swim to bring this boxed set blending the world of Dungeons and Dragons with the mad narcissistic, narcissistic genius of Rick Sanchez's Our Gaming Sensibilities. And it includes everything a dungeon master needs to channel, channel their inner mad scientist and run a Rick rolling adventure for up to five players, levels one to three. So this one's actually, oddly enough, has the thickest rule book, 64 page rule book. Um, it has an adventure called The Lost Dungeon of Rickedness, Big Rick Energy. It's a 44 page adventure, which is shorter than Fandelver, and I think the same as the essential kit. You get a DM screen which just to me seems kind of random in this, but I got to say if that DM screen has all the stuff you'd want on a full DM screen for D&D, that might be enough just because it's a cool Rick and Morty themed DM screen. Uh, you get five pre-gens and 11 dice. So this one, again, the pre-gens are all uh, sort of characters related to the TV show or in fact, the comic book, because this yeah. is actually based off of an IDG comic book series two two comic book series of D, &D versus rick and morty mm -hmm. now this adventure again is going to get you level one to three but it's very short uh again no character generation whatsoever um the adventure goes back to D D's roots which i think is interesting because the other ones didn't uh, this is a classic dungeon crawl lots of text boxes read out loud text now, it really pushes for the DM to do the Inception thing and role play. You are meant to be Rick. You are meant to use your annoyed, condescending voice and power game the hell out of this. The, the rule book is actually filled not only with the core rules of the game, but also with Rick's comments mm -hmm. on the core rules of the game. So even just reading through the rules is a meta adventure in itself. Yes. And I have been told that it has some really good DM advice in there mixed in with the bad. And you got to be careful to know which is which. Now, looking at this, um, the dungeon is very scripted. Uh, there are very few options. And one of the things that I, I didn't, I couldn't find out a lot of the, about this in the Stranger Thing one. But the way Fandelver's written and the way the Essential Kid Adventures is you could replay them. And they could be completely different experiences. While you're going to encounter the same things, how you approach them is going to change. Stranger Things, I, I unfortunately couldn't find a lot of information on. But this one, I have been told, has like no replayability. That once you've gone through it, you've done the thing, you've had the journey, there's no reason to do it again. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of inside jokes that will just get old fast <laughs> if you try yes. to replay now, the adventure is just long enough that you probably want two sessions, but again, you could do it all in one long game. Again, this is really rubbing me as a one-shot. Like, it sounds like a fantastic Rick and Morty product. Like, like an awesome Rick and Morty product. Like, like reviews say it's also a solid intro to D&D, &D, though. And I have read accounts of people getting into D&D &D from this. So again, you've got the, the bait, right? That's a, This feels a lot like the Stranger Things set. Which things were both put out the same year, and I'm sure they both that, that's exactly what they were meant to be, is is this bait for fans of various pop culture references. Yeah. Now this is specifically not called a starter box, but nope. it does contain essentially all the, all the starter content you need except for character creation. So in some ways, this is the the just before essentials box. Mm -hmm. Now one of the things that I found about this is that the game involves a lot of sort of 
messing with everybody else. So the GM is the GM is in, is encouraged to mess with the players. And yeah. The players are encouraged to mess with each other. So if that sort of inter-party conflict mm-hmm. is not your cup of tea, step back, be aware that that is what is encouraged in this yeah. game. And to me, that's not a good game of D and D. So I, as really much as I represent- am a Rick and Morty fan. Yeah. <laughs> me that's like a bad representation of what dungeons and dragons has become in a way which is 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 questionable but i guess you're supposed to know that from rick and morty i mean rick and morty is about messing with each other right it's it's a very dysfunctional family and and that's sort of the root of it so in some ways you you should and and would expect that but as a dnd player that's not to me as a dnd player that's not good playing I won't say that that everyone should play that way. Everyone can play however they would like, but uh, you're supposed to be a group playing together to achieve things, not you know it's undercutting not meant each other to be every a competition. step. Exactly. I don't know. Again, this sounds great for Rick and Morty fans. Uh, and again, maybe this is a good way to see if you and your friends dig Dungeons and Dragons. But like, I think if it does, you're just going to go pick up one of the other box sets on this list. Yeah. Like, unless. In, in you're a diehard Rick and Morty fan. I don't see any reason to pick this one up. I think if you are a diehard Rick and Morty fan, even if you don't want to play D and D, this is probably actually a fun piece of th- something to read through, and there it may go. tickle your role playing, uh, you know, urges, and maybe maybe you do move on to role playing from it. But uh, more than anything, it's just you know another fun piece of Rick and Morty merchandise to pick up along the way. So that's it for the currently existing D&D starter sets that are out there now. Now, there's one more coming, and that is going to be a U.S. Target store exclusive. It's going to hit shelves on July 31st. It is going to retail $19.99 U.S. Note, you won't be able to get it anywhere else until October. Now, this one is going to be called Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. Now, the box what we know of the box for this so yeah, far the, the, the blurb in the, <laughs> the, the blurb we got sheets. is get ready for a brand new starter set experience the dungeons and dragons starter set dragons of Stormwreck. Uh, Stormwreck isle contains the essential rules of the game plus everything you need to play heroic characters caught up in an ancient war among dragons as they explore the secrets of Stormwreck isle all right, we're looking at a 48-page adventure booklet with everything you need to get started, a 32-page rule book, only going from level one to three. So for the official Watsy non-weird branded, this is the lowest range of characters. You are getting five ready-to-play characters. No, ready-to-play means pre-generated, so no character generation. And of course, a character sheet, and oddly the least number of dice out of all the sets with only six. Which I guess part of it's that I'm assuming you probably roll 4d6 to generate stats. I don't know. I, I, I assume at this point D&D's probably all point by in arrays. But it's just odd that like some of the sets you get 11 dice, some you get 6. That's a significant difference. So they're calling this an ideal introduction to the world of Dungeons & Dragons, offering players and Dungeon Masters a turnkey onboarding experience. So right there, this is going to be where they send you now. I'm assuming... Or maybe it's just where they send mass market people and only this will only be available in uh, mass market stores because they do say other stores in October. But doesn't like like they may be just going for the mainstream market and not the hobby market or the comic book market. I don't know, but it sure sounds like this is going to be the gateway. But for all you know, they'll keep the other one going. (laughs) Yeah, so this one is is interesting. No character creation is is indicated in any way that we can find. So, yeah. Supposedly much shorter adventure book, like if you compare the page counts, much shorter than Fandelver. So um this I I you weren't able to find it, but I did find someone actually went through and found the graphic of the index of the book in small okay. and blew it up and and did some work. This is in the Forgotten Realms. Okay. Which we weren't I Googled sure about. Stormwreck Isles and I couldn't find <laughs> anything. Yeah. So uh according to the the index of the uh the GM guide, this is part of Forgotten Realms. Uh it is so still, in a way that's good. Yeah. I have no complaint with that. Uh it is still a four chapter adventure, which is the same chapter length as okay. the current starter box. 
Um, and uh, WizKids is putting out a miniature line to support oh, both the figure, both the characters and a number of monsters. So we do actually have, if you if you check out the, the WizKids miniatures, you do get an idea of some of the monsters that you'll be facing in yeah. the uh, in the included adventures. Now, what I am seeing is no DM screen and no maps. So I'm a little confused that we're going to get a bunch of miniatures, but there's no combat map. Like there's no gridded map. That's a little strange. Usually if you're going to do the minis, you get the maps to go with them. Of course, you could probably buy a map from WizKids sold separately or something like that. Um, I am glad it's in, in the realms like Stormwreck Isles. I, I'm wondering if they finally created someone new for the realms to <laughs> keep it apart from everything else that's going on. I don't know. Like, like looking at this, it kind of looks like a step backwards, especially from the essentials kit. But like it, it seems to be a step backwards from even the original starter set. And it's not like it has a super lower price. Like if this was now a $15 entry. That would also make more sense. So interestingly, what I've seen from a couple of sort of follow up uh, posts and, and content uh, reviews are it looks like they've dumbed it down in paper. So they're actually pushing less paper out the door, but okay. using QR codes, they've actually got videos and web pages and online content uh, to help back you up and help support the written content. And to be fair in the modern, you know, these kids, kids are kids today are living on their, on their devices. Yeah. They, that probably works better for them than it does for you and I. <laughs> well, see, as I've already figured out that they just don't seem to get rid of any old content online that doesn't sound bad. But if you're like me and you have a starter set from 2014 sitting back there and it is now how many? I don't even know how many years from 2014 to now. That's that's more math than I can do in my head right now. But <laughs> what, are those QR codes still going to work? Like that? That's what I worry about, right? Well, like, the, the reason I think it might be is apparently this is actually designed to transition from the starter set into what they're calling the D and D curriculum in schools. So I, it, it looks like their new, their, their current uh, long-term plan starts with this box and continues through the schooling system that they are trying to push into the educational system and after school programs. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I don't see mentioned at all about this new set is D and D Beyond. Now I will admit, right now I should have said this at the top of the episode. We are not going to get into D and D Beyond. That is a valid option as a way to learn D and D, and a gateway to D and D is to join D and D Beyond and play with people online. That is a thing many people do. We specifically wanted to talk about starter sets since that's what Kevin asked. I haven't seen anything about this new set in D and D Beyond because I have been told that one of the things DD beyond offers is additional content for these existing starter sets that, that like once you finish fandelver you can then go online to DD beyond and get more stuff well and fandelver at least was for a time during the pandemic offered free. completely for free yeah. uh to all DD beyond members um yeah and i the DD beyond thing is is i i almost started looking at it and then i stopped like, because there's no, too it's, many it's, different levels of subscription and add-on content. Um, it seems to me that more than likely they are, especially considering the fact that, let's be honest, Wizards just purchased D&D Beyond, uh, yes. that they are going to be incorporating all D&D content and D&D moving forward. They, they want yeah. players to become used to d d Beyond as part of the d d experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be honest, from what I don't, I know of d d Beyond from watching other people, that may not be a bad thing. It's, you know, characters anywhere. It's your, it's basically your Google Drive for all your things d d What would be really nice, though, is that if you bought the thing book in the real world, you got the d d Beyond copy. It didn't have to buy a separate digital copy. That's when I might actually try out the d Beyond. Maybe I'm just being old and grumpy. But that's where well, and again, I draw there's, the line. There is some weirdness because line. there's there's two different subscription levels and they do offer some things depending on your subscription level. But because uh, your, your basic subscription level for unlimited characters and, and other content is only two ninety nine a month. Still, which I, again, I compared to most you access to your books, that's the problem. Yeah, see, I don't know. And again, I don't I don't know all the things, but yeah. a lot of times they they only expect the DM to be the one buying the books. Um, so that's the same now. Yep. 
I, I don't know, fine too. But anyway, we're not here to talk about D&D, but that's a totally different topic. If you want us to talk about that, we can do the research. So at this point, we talked about physical bo- box sets you can buy. There is another valid way to get into D&D that's still physical, not joining D&D Beyond, no subscription or anything like that. Is And, and a lot of people don't realize this, but the basic rules, the core rules for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons are 100% free. They are available on Wizards of the Coast website. The uh, you could go right now and grab it. They're not very long. I think it's about eight pages of rules. And then the rest is all like spells and magic items and stuff, reference material. And this is how I learned fifth edition D&D. I have a printed out copy of the basic rules in a binder. And when I ran D&D encounters, when fifth ed started, that's what I used. That's what I had. I didn't, the player's handbook didn't exist yet. And then when it did, I just kept using these because it was the same thing. Um, since the inception of D&D and they, they're promising they will always be free. You just go there and you download them. And so the basic rules run from uh, levels 1 to 20 and cover the cleric, fighter, rogue, and wizard, presenting what we view as the essential subclass for each. It also provides the dwarf, elf, halfling, and human as racial options. In addition, the rules contain 120 spells, five backgrounds, and character sheets. Now, what you're not going to get is all the other, the bells and whistles, all the nice stuff that you're going to get, right? All the stuff that, that comes in the intro box, the, the additional tools, right? You're not going to get a DM screen. You're going to have to provide your own dice. You probably have a friend to have them. There'll be a local game store. No pre-generated characters. And to me, most importantly, no introductory adventure. Anyone who's new to role-playing, I, I, this is a, a pet peeve of mine. I personally think every role-playing game core book and every beginner box should come with an adventure to show the Gunja Master, DM, whatever you want to call it, um, how the game is meant to be run. Like, to me, that is an, a, a core part of the system is to be like, okay, here's everything I've given you. Here's what I expect you to do with it. That's It's a love letter to the DM of, here's what this game's designed to do. Without that, all you got is a bunch of numbers. And trust me, there was a point in time in my life when the only AD&D second edition product I owned was the player's handbook, and we didn't know what the heck we were doing and just fought each other's characters all the time because the rules didn't really explain there was more than that because we didn't have the Dungeon Master's Guide. So this is a set of mechanics. This is rules. This is game mechanics. The rest is up to you and your group to do on your own. Now, note there is a DM set, so it does kind of talk about how to run the game, and you do get monster spells and items. So the, literally everything you need to run, you could run an entire campaign of D&D from level 1 to 20 from those rules, from those free core rules. But there's no help, no hand-holding, just a big pile of stuff without a lot of guidance with what to do with it. Now, if you can find an experienced DM from any system, really, not just D&D, this may actually be the best way to go. Now, well, I personally think these are definitely better suited for someone who knows role-playing games. I think it's also um, good for people who are curious about D&D, but even more so where I think these really shine is for the OD&D, AD&D, AD&D 2nd Edition, 3.5, Pathfinder, people who are like, okay, what's the big deal with 5th Ed? Why, Why is everyone falling in love with 5th Ed? Let's find out what happened to the game I grew up playing. That's where I think these are perfect. This, is, this is where to, I should be going. Really. Yeah, if, if, if you are looking to get back into D&D and already know what D&D is, because to be honest, the, the kind of basic flow of the game and basic mechanics of roll a 20-sided die, compare it to a number and ask the DM what happens, hasn't really changed. And the lore is all still very similar. You're still doing the usual things you did at first level now that you did back in the 70s. So if you have a familiar with D&D, this may be the best place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, I, I, I played 2E, I played 2.5, uh, but then I kind of walked away from D&D and went elsewhere. So this is what will get me where I need to, uh, where I need to go. So there you have it. six different entry points for Dungeons & Dragons. Official, official entry points. There are, of course, more. Uh, which one is best is going to be up to your group, though. I think most groups are going to be picking between the starter set, the currently existing starter set and the essentials kit, though. 
I, I am not seeing any reason at this point to wait for the Target exclusive set coming out in a month. While the Stranger Things and Rick and Morty sets look cool, and they may be awesome for getting fans of those series into D&D, they don't seem like a great spot for someone who's already interested in D&D. If you're like, I want to start playing D&D, where do I start? I would avoid those. So again, if your group loves Rick and Morty or Stranger Things, they could be a valid starting place because both products are complete standalone products that do teach you the mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons. And while always, if you don't want to spend any money, you can play D&D for free. You can find an online dice roller, borrow a phone, make use scraps of paper. Uh, this hobby does not need to be expensive. You can get none of the bells and whistles for 100% free. Yeah. And now for me, while they're while the rules are absolutely in the Rick and Morty and Stranger Things boxes, I wouldn't encourage non-gamers to use them to get into D&D. I feel like there's just so much baggage from the the product lines of Rick and Morty and Stranger Things mm -hmm. that transitioning from that into I, I hate to use the term, but pure D&D &D is going to be a rough ride. Yeah, and plus there's the, again, there's the lore, right? There's years of lore built into Dungeons and Dragons. We talked about how all of the starter sets, uh, except for the rethemed ones, are set in a, a world called the Forgotten Realms. The tone, especially of Rick and Morty, which has player versus player interaction and combat, is going to be very different than the tone of a traditional Dungeons and Dragons game with its three pillars of, you know, leveling up, exploration, combat. It's going to be totally different. Now, as for my recommendation, start with starter set. Um, it's cheap. Uh, like uh, the, the MSRP is down to 17, whatever, but you can find it cheaper than that. Uh, even in Canada, I've seen it pretty low. I have seen it in the US drop as low as $8 on, on you know, Black Friday, Prime Day, stuff like that. Now, that is unless your group really is pushing to play their own character. Like if, I, I, again, I haven't talked to Tech's daughter about this or Kevin's daughter, but if Kevin's daughter is like me and my friends want to play D&D, &D, we spent the last week sketching our characters and we really want to have an adventure together. Like my daughter does this kind of stuff. Like my daughter will make an OC and come up with their colors and all this stuff before we sat down to play something. And then if I sit down and go, OK, you've got to play the Burly Dwarf or you've got to play whatever. And she'd be like, but I want to play my character. Right? If, if that's your group then jump right to the essentials kit because you get to play your own character. Now, the adventure in the starter set, by all accounts, is better and longer. You basically get a full campaign and you get to experience five levels of play. And it's more new DM friendly than the essentials kit and the other two sets that we're going to not bother mentioning again. Right. And now, again, there is some and there's some confusing this there's, there's some <laughs> there's some confusing confusing uh online aspect of this. I believe that when you buy the starter set, you are getting some D&D Beyond content unlocked. And they and there is a Not free mine. and there is a free level of D&D Beyond usage. There is a free tier. So that always online uh, a digital aspect, digital management is becoming a growing important thing for currently online generations. So uh, it's certainly something to think about and consider keeping the back of your mind as you're moving forward with D&D. &D. Now, if you played D&D &D before any edition, literally any edition, I think you should just start with the essentials kit. I think that's going to really shine. Your players are going to appreciate being able to make your own characters and will probably better enjoy the sandbox style adventure. Yeah. The other key feature of essentials is that one on one rule set. Mm -hmm. So if it's just you and a friend or a sibling, this may push you from the starter to essentials just in order to deal with that smaller player count without, as Mo mentioned, having to, you know, handle multiple characters at yeah. uh, one time. Now, honestly, though, I None of this is expensive, especially if you compare it to other role-playing game box sets. Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast has priced these as a lost leader. They are not making a ton of money on these. They are doing this so you will get into their game and then go spend more money on all the other stuff. 
What I actually would do myself if I was just about to get in is pick up both. I would go get the starter set and the essentials kit. I'm going to get additional dice. I'm going to get reference cards. Those cards could be so useful. I hate looking up stuff in books. Just having all those cards from the essentials kit. You're going to get a DM screen, which uh, pro tip, put it to the side. Don't sit behind it. Don't put a wall between you. You can still hide your stuff. Put it off to the side. And then I would probably play through Fendover. Um, I'm an experienced role player DM, so I wouldn't have a problem with this. I would probably also give my players the option to make their own characters. So I would kind of match the two into my own hybrid D&D starter set. Now, of course, this will depend on how much disposable income you've got. But if you can afford it and do feel like you really are interested in the world of D&D, this gives you the most to work with. Now, however, it is also potentially a lot more reading and a chance sure. to get overwhelmed before you even start. So that just, you know, your levels of, sure. of ability to focus, stay focused of the people involved may come into uh, play. Yeah, what I would recommend is if you do buy both, just start with one, like, like read through the starter set and then decide, all right, we, let, let's play this. You know what? That's enough. That's enough for me right now. Let's try this out and see if I'm, I'm willing to learn more uh, or just dive all in and read everything. Now, before we go, um, <laughs> this is this is the Jeff Seuss clause. I feel the need to point out there are other role playing games out there other than Dungeons and Dragons, despite what you see in popular culture. And some of them have truly amazing starter sets. Now, I love RPG beginner boxes. Any longtime fan knows this by now. I love to read them. I like to run them. I like to see how every company and designer and writer does things differently. I like to see the differences in what they choose to put in the box. I have reviewed a number of these over at tabletopbellhop.com, and I do invite you to check them out when you have time. Now, some of my favorite RPG beginner boxes include the amazing The One Ring starter set. This has you playing hobbits going on a bit of an adventure around the Shire. There's the Tales from the Loop starter set, which has you solving mysteries as kids in an 80s that never was. One of the all-time best beginner boxes I've ever played is the Pathfinder beginner box, which I actually think is the best F20, so D20 fantasy starter set I've ever seen. And then for something completely different, moving away from the fantasy aspects and the, the mysticism and sci-fi, is the Sentinel comic starter set, which to this day is honestly one of the best superhero RPGs I've ever played. And it includes more scenarios and adventures than I've ever seen in one starter set. Now, another one, if you want to stay on the supers train, and I generally do, uh -huh, Spectaculars is another super box set that is a little pricey compared to what uh, a generic starter box. But this gives you a great setting and a full narrative system to play in. Now, another thing I do want to mention, uh, just because we haven't brought it up, and honestly, one of the best ways to learn any role-playing game is to find someone who already knows how to play. Uh, someone in our chat has mentioned this, that local libraries are now a big source of getting people into role-playing games, which is amazing. Um, I think, unfortunately, I don't know of one local. Local game stores tend to run game nights. You can play online. We talked about D&D Beyond. One of the best ways to learn Dungeons & Dragons is to find someone who already knows it and have them teach you. Now, this may not be your, your, your choice. Like, personally, I like reading rules and teaching games. I learned to play Dungeons & Dragons from reading a book. I learned my first role-playing game from reading a, a box set. The, there was no internet, no way to go look this stuff up, and I didn't even know if anyone down the street might be playing it. Some people prefer that, but if that's not you, finding an established group or gaming area is a great way to do it now nowadays most local game stores are going to have some form of dungeons and dragon support whether it's adventure league in the store or they're going to know who to send you to absolutely so that's it for our look at various dungeons and dragons beginner boxes <laughs> out there now remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions every week. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Hello, and welcome to our review of the Space Base Command Station from AEG. So the Space Base Command Station is the second expansion for Space Base. 
which features new content designed by John D. Clare, the original designer of Space Base, and features artwork by Chris Aubin and Chris Walton. This expansion was released in 2019 by Aldrich Entertainment Group, better known as AEG. This big box has an MSRP of 49, sorry, 44.99, which should be a good indication you're getting more than just a new box. So figuring out why you're paying that price has proven more difficult than you might expect. So we're here to help you out. So the command station expansion from Space Base is advertised as, and this is right from AEG's website, the big box to hold everything, which is only one of the things it provides. In addition to a storage box that will hold Space Base, Shy Pluto, any of the promos currently released, and room for future expansions, you also get all of the stuff needed to play with two more players, including player boards, tracking cubes, and two sets of starting ship cards. But wait, there's more. With the box and higher player count, you also get 14 new pre-deployed ship cards, two per player. These are used when playing six and seven player games. But that's not all. You also get seven pairs of D6 dice, a set in each of the player colors, and 30 extra charge cubes. Next, we have something that is honestly not even listed on AEG's website, or the product page that lists the contents. Card sleeves for all of your space base cards. Finally, there's a rule book, which is notable. The great thing about this rule book in the command station is that it includes all of the existing rules for space base in one place. You get the base rules a lot, as well as the rules for Shy Pluto kind of integrated together into one book. Now to take a look at all this stuff, check out our space base command station unboxing video on YouTube. Now, overall, the component quality is as good as you would expect, and most importantly, perfectly matches the quality of the original game. Now, my only complaint here, and it's a very minor one, is that the green and teal dice are far too close in color. And actually, there's a chance my copy may have gotten three green and one teal, but I'm not even sure because they're that close. We actually sat these dice on top of a big LED studio light, and only then, could you actually see the difference mm -hmm. on the table in normal overhead lighting? They are the same. Now, sorry, I do actually have one more campaign. I, and, and this one's significant. Nowhere in this box is anything to show you how to use it and how to put stuff away. I would have liked something showing me what they expect you to put where. This is really frustrating, and judging by the number of threads on Board Game Geek <laughs> asking how other people have organized their game, we're not alone. And I never actually found an official answer from AEG, so I don't even know if there's one out there. So, just how useful are these new things added to Space Base by Command Station? Is everyone who owns Space Base going to want to pick this up? Well, let's start with the bigger box and the insert. What, what it's selling you on the cover? As noted above, the biggest complaint is the lack of instructions on what goes where. Honestly, every time I put this game away, things end up in different spots. Like, I just kind of fit them where they fit. I would have definitely appreciated some direction as to what goes where. Now, that said, the new box and insert does exactly what it's supposed to do. It does fit everything, and there seems to be plenty of room left for at least one, if not more, future expansions. They do claim all future expansions, though if the game remains popular long enough, I could see them having to retract that unless they already have a roadmap with a hard ending for the game. Yeah, there's other games out there by other companies, <clears throat> Dominion, that have claimed that they were done, that have still kept putting out content. So I'm never going to say never on that one. Now, what I do want to call out about this insert it is that this is a pretty standard plastic box insert you would get with a traditional board game or with some toys or packaging material. This is is your thin one piece molded piece of plastic vacuum and vacuum, vacuum seal form. or whatever vacuum form. That's the word I was looking for. What you're not getting here is, you know, a deluxe game trays insert with individual storage containers for specific components with uh, inlaid graphics to show you what goes where and stuff that you can just pull out of the box and put right onto the table to play. While this insert is functional as far as storing everything and it does let you fit everything in a box, it doesn't actually do anything to improve the game. It doesn't speed up or really slow down or affect teardown or setup. 
it's just a holder. Which is fair and nice, but some people are likely going to still be seeking out third-party solutions. Mm -hmm. And those are already out there on Etsy for purchase, as well as STL files to print yourself. Next, we have the stuff for playing with six or seven players. Uh, this includes new player boards, starting cubes, and starter cards. They all match the quality of the original and come in two new colors. Plus, they have the added bonus of giving you more colors to pick from when you're not playing with a full player count, which actually is a thing. This is just a great addition. More people, while they do extend the game, makes for more space base, and that's not a bad thing. Now, when you do play it with six or seven players, there are rule changes, which I do want to highlight. With six or seven players, everyone's going to get a pair of the new pre-deployed monitor relay craft cards. These go in your seven and eight slot, but these are pre-deployed. So it means they're tucked, right? They're flipped and tucked with the red ability showing. And actually, like, so you don't mess it up. They don't even have the blue ability. So it's not that they replace your seven, eight cards. You still have your seven, eight starter. These are on the red side. Now, both cards have the same ability and they require three charge cubes to use. They let you either roll the bonus dice, which is you get to roll two dice and you get whatever you rolled and that no one else is affected by them. Or you get to draw two ship cards from any deck. So one, two or three, and then purchase up to one of those cards drawn. Now, how these cards actually affect play is to let players generate extra resources through the bonus dice or use up resources they've accumulated before their turn. Because with six or seven players, it's pretty common to end up with a lot of credits between your turns because six or five other players are going before you get to go. And the way Space Space works is you tend to generate stuff on everyone's turn. So it's really nice to have a way to spend them before it gets to you. Plus, it gives you that extra buy because on your turn, you're only allowed to buy one card. So this lets you, uh, before your turn comes around, to possibly buy another one. And I've got to say, the biggest surprise in this box, well, no, the biggest surprise was some of the stuff that was in it. I didn't know was in it. The biggest surprise mechanically, the biggest change to the game was this. I was really surprised by how much this impacted the game. It was just more than we expected. Like, oh, I've got a seven or eight. And anyone that knows 2D6s knows that's pretty much the peak of the bell curve on a 2D6. So it's not like they don't come up often. Um, and I also like the fact that they do what Space Base does. They do the thing that Space Base is known for, is it gives you something to pay attention to, to focus on and think about on other players' turns. It keeps you engaged when it's not your turn, which is the best part of Space Base. Indeed, even as the game length, length extends with additional players, you're still doing something every turn. How much you can do also depends on what expansions you have, of course. Yes. Next, we have the dice. I Honestly, I wouldn't have thought of it. Having dice for every player is awesome. The biggest thing is the recommendation in the rule book that you leave your dice face up after you've rolled them. For one, this helps with the what'd you roll again problem, as well as giving players a chance to leave the table for a bio break or some other reason or to go make a coffee. Then they can come back and quickly see what numbers were rolled while they were gone. That is fantastic. Now, the only drawback we found with everyone having their own dice is you miss the very clear, now it's your turn, indicator of passing the dice because normally in the original game once you were done your turn you pass the dice and it was very clear okay i'm done you go you do lose that now this is something that i honestly had no clue i had no idea that space base command station was going to give me more dice yeah and i think the benefit of leaving your dice up far outweighs the next turn handoff uh, yeah. the fact that the game doesn't grind to a halt when someone goes for a bio break or for any reason is really huge, especially yeah. with high player counts. Because if you've got seven people, you would have previously had to stop dead if someone left the table. Because if you just kept going, that player would have to, you'd have to write down a list. Yeah, I was going to say, the this, you know, even if you didn't stop, it's a matter of what'd you roll? Okay, what'd you roll? Yeah. Oh, did I have, wait, I rolled a seven. Yeah, but what two numbers? Was it a four and a three or a two and a five? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, exactly. All that's gone. Exactly. Uh, extra charge cubes, they're extra charge cubes. I'll admit we never ran out with the originals. Maybe with six or seven players, we might have run out. But you know what? It's nice not to worry about it. You got higher player count, more cubes. Yay, more cubes. I guess this sort of thing should just be a given when you're adding more players. You add more of the things they need. Yep. Next are the sleeves. This is the one thing that comes in the box no one seems to know about. 
I think the only reason people do know about this is like Instagram and Twitter and people sharing pictures of their sleeve cards. I am sure there's probably someone out there right now who's listening to us who was like, wait, you said sleeves? It comes with sleeves? I have no idea why the sleeves you get in this box aren't mentioned anywhere. They're not on the contents. They're not on AEG's website. Now, these sleeves fit the space base cards, right? Space base cards are funky. It's like a card cut in half and not in the Hobbit size way. And they sl slot, I don't know, whatever, sleeve really nicely. Um, they, they're they nice and thick. They're I don't know what mill they are or anything like that for fans of that, but they're nice, thick cards and very tight. Uh, now, personally, I'm not a fan of sleeving my cards. I did try sleeving some of the cards just to check it out and see how slippery they are. I hate shuffling sleeved cards, and I find sleeved card stacks tend to slide. Uh, plus, specifically, when I play Space Base, I like to use a Lazy Susan. Lazy Susan with slippery stacks is not good. Um, sleeve stack your cards slide, and these Space Base cards are no exception. They're they're, they're not tactile. They, they, they become slippery. Plus, the added thickness of the sleeves make the card stacks high. Like, the one deck was here, and now it's, you know, not twice as high, but it's up there. Yep. And... I get it to the high, the taller the stack, the more chance things are going to slide and fall. Now, for those of you who like sleeves, you get sleeves, lots of them. Now, I have to say, I too am a heathen that doesn't sleeve, but sleeves aren't cheap. And of course, the half width size of space based cards make them a bit more unique. So it's nice to get all of your sleeves in one place for those that do use them. Now, up last, we have the new rule book, which is an end, something I didn't expect from the book that I really appreciate. Now, what's interesting is this isn't just like the two original rule books mashed together. This is a simplified order book that just has the rules you need to play, including Shy Pluto. There's no background. There's no backstory. One of the things we talked about when we reviewed Space Base was the AEG started off as an RPG company. You could see it like there's all this backstory and all the different ship types and all that. You're not going to find any of this. You're even going to find less art than the original rule book. This is all functional. This is all rules, no fluff, which honestly is great for a rule refresher for those who don't remember the original game and for referencing while playing. Though it will be interesting to see what happens when the further extensions uh, expansions are added, as this rule book will no longer be the full rule set. Yeah, that's true. If they do add some, maybe then later expansions will come with a new replacement rule book. Like, I'm actually at the point now where I can toss out my original rule book because I've got this one. Overall, I was personally, like, really surprised. I, I was surprised by the amount of different stuff you get with the Space Base Command Station. I, like, I originally thought it was just a box. Like, when I started doing research, I'm like, ah, it's a big box. Do I need a big box? And then I learned you get to play with more people. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You get to play with more people. Then I heard there were some special cards in there. And at that point, I'm like, all right, I want it. I didn't even know what the cards are for. I just knew there were more cards. I'm like, more cards? Oh, I'll get it. Yeah, it's only like 14 two per player, but two new cards is new cards. That's awesome. I had no clue there was dice, card sleeves, and a better rule reference. And I got to say, all of that is a very pleasant surprise. Again, we knew there had to be a reason for the price, and it was nice to see it was justified in the end. If you own Space Base and Sky Pluto, you're going to want to pick this up if you haven't already. Now, if you're planning on picking up the Mysteries of Terra Proxima, that's the next expansion, you're probably going to want this even more because it's going to fit. With this expansion, not only do you get a big box to store all your stuff, you get higher player count, more dice, more referenceable rulebook, and sleeves for all your cards. Yeah, really not a single complaint, unless maybe you already yeah. sleeved all your cards previously. Yeah, I can definitely see that. If you've already got sleeve cards. Now, I will say the most popular brand, which I'm not going to call out, they are thinner and do not hold the cards as tight as the ones that were included in this. Um, I had the name somewhere earlier in the chat, and I think we skipped over it. Um, so, no, someone in the chat asked if they were as slippery as, and I missed it. So I do apologize for not having the name of that company, but there was a popular company that did space based cards. These are supposedly tighter and thinner. Or sorry, thicker, thicker. These are thicker. Now, where I'm not sure, and I have to leave it up to you, is for people who own Space Base but not Shy Pluto. I'm not sure if the price of this box can be justified unless you do usually play with six or seven players. 
and you're going to get use out of those additional player boards. While there's more than you'd expect in this box, the main purpose of this expansion is a better storage solution. And if you don't have the expansion, you don't need that. Everything fits in your core box. And for some, it may not be the storage solution you need. Though I must point out that many, if not all, of the third-party modular solutions still use the command station box size in order to yeah. fit everything. Yeah, you're not going to find Etsy shops where you get the fit shy Pluto in the base box with the proper insert. I, do, I don't think that's actually possible. Now, I, I have to say this because I think it's important, but if you don't enjoy Space Base, you don't need this. I realize that seems self-explanatory, but you now and then board game expansions come out that fix a base game in a way that it'll become more attractive to a larger group of gamers. Uh, the Herb Witches for Quacks of Quedlinburg we talked about last week is a good example. That might have won over people who didn't like the original. You're not going to find that here. This isn't one of those expansions. This is for a box for fans of Space Base, especially those people who plan on collecting all the expansion content. Being able to play two more players isn't going to make the game better, and those six, seven cards only use then. Well, that's it for our review of the Command Station expansion for Space Base. Did you know this one came with sleeves? You wouldn't be the only one who didn't. <laughs> Now, before we go, I do want to invite you to check out my written review of this expansion over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now, it's Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so the big thing that happened this past week is I did finally give Scythe another shot. Uh, the problem is I'm not sure I can trust my judgment of this game after that play, as it was probably the longest and most casual game of Scythe ever played. Uh, that should have been a live stream. Uh, we played with Tori and Kat, who just gotten some fantastic news and were in the mood to celebrate. They showed up with drinks and this celebration came in the form of multiple craft beers and pre-mixed drinks. Well, we probably should have put Scythe aside for another week. That was the original plan. And I thought, you know, if we start with this, like right after dinner, before anyone's had anything, this should work. And then we'll move on to something, you know, later after that. I'm not sure if I actually made the wrong choice there or not. Because the thing is, we had a great time. This was a super casual game where we basically just played to find out what happened we were like eh, let's try this oh we haven't done this yet what happens if you go over here Th this was very much a game of discovery which yes had quite a bit of rule referencing when tried someone tried something and i've got to say stonemeyer nailed it with the player aid cards because it wasn't all a matter of looking stuff up in the book it was almost all there though deanna and myself would ask to be it a little bigger next time put it on a bigger sheet so, and really, any positive experience with Scythe after your initial experiences yeah. is probably a good thing to help balance out your preconceptions for when you do play a proper review game. Yeah, it's true. Like, I had, I had a, a great experience and a terrible experience, so now when I sit down to like, oh, we're going to play Scythe and take it seriously, um, it might be all the better. Now, even Jamie recommends not trying to win your first couple games aside. Like, it basically has, like, a whole thing where it's like, no, no, trust me. Just, just like, and it has suggestions for your first turn where it's like, one player take one of the top actions and see how it works. The next player pick a different top action and see how that works. And it really pushes the just play. Like, just play the game and you'll get it. Because reading it, there's just too many moving parts. And I've got to agree. There is a lot of moving parts and interactions in that game that aren't clear until you start playing. And it honestly really reminded me of Tapestry. Reading the rules for Tapestry compared to playing Tapestry are two very different things. Um, it, we kind of overdid this. Like, we took this to extreme levels. Um, Scythe, at a player count where you're at, is supposed to be like an hour and a half. And our game was over five and a half hours. So, so just a little off. Um, no, again, drinks were involved. Um, and most of that time was chatting, laughing, telling stories. It just happened that Scythe was out on the table while we were doing all this. Well, let's be honest. One of the main reasons to play board games is to enjoy time with other people and socialize. So in mm -hmm. that, the game hit a home run. Yes, though I think most people playing Scythe spend a little more focus on the game. Um, as for what we thought, I do agree with Jamie. The, the best way to learn this game probably is just to play it because uh, figuring out things as you're going, it, it 
went really well because like as usual with Stonemaier, it's move your pawn on a, it, it's a, the, the disney villainous action selection system basically move your pawn on a spot and it can't go where it already was and you're going to do an action and then you have the option of doing another action and and that's it like that's the basic mechanic and then each action is not bad it's like move move two of your units one hex that's it that's what move does right and and but figuring out how to do them separate from why to do them is two completely different things and it was one of those nights where we would figure out why we would do stuff like halfway through the night we're sitting there playing and it's like oh oh now i know why you might want to do that and realizing especially with upgrading like improving your board why you would do certain upgrades at certain times and how they interact and things like that the only concern, I guess, would be how many of those moments will you remember, given <laughs> the imbibing of refreshments taking place? I'm all good, but I'm not sure if Tori knows he played side. No. Now, we started early enough. He'll at least remember the beginning of the game, I hope. Now, at this point, I, I really don't want to say too much more about it without more plays, like uh, especially more sober plays. Um, since we did have a good time. I don't know how much of that was scythe and how much was the people we played with and how much was the alcohol. I will say that everyone, uh, Tori in particular, enjoyed it enough. They want to play again and play again soon. Like there was like like the, hey, when can we play again thing going on? And that is a major step up from your previous opinions on the game. Yes, where I was like, no, nah, I don't need to play this game. Now, after scythe, I decided to try something. I broke out for the queen. Now, the thing with this one is that Tori and Kat's only real tabletop role-playing game experience is Dungeons & Dragons. Hey, I'm tying everything back to the main topic here. Now, along with that, they have lots of computer role-playing game JRPG knowledge and know the, like, the premise of role-playing games, but pretty much all of their in-person gaming has been trad RPGs, where the game basically boils down to ask the DM for permission to do things and sometimes roll dice to determine outcomes. Or the Queen is very much not that kind of game. And I am well aware of this conflict, as my current mass game has a trad RPG player who has been playing for I don't even know how long in, in purely trad RPGs. And while we're slowly bringing them out of their shell and getting them to narrate their experiences, it is a struggle as they are very used to the old way. And, uh, you know, we just had an experience where the outcome of a role was they narrate the actions of the enemy and they couldn't uh, getting them couldn't to grasp yeah. that is something that's really tough for a mm -hmm. tribe player. Now, for those that don't know it for the queen is a card driven past the stick improv heavy role playing game where each part player is part of a retinue traveling with the queen whom they love to a negotiation with a foreign power. Now, the way the game's played is by flipping cards and answering questions that come from the cards. The entire concept broke Tori and I think also kind of blew Kat's mind, but she was the one sober person who was there. So I think she got the concept and it seemed a little more comfortable with it. This was so different from what they were used to, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, the biggest thing and, and, and my most joy of the entire evening is that Tori in particular got it instantly. Like, okay, I love the queen, so I love her. The first card that came up, he answered right away, like instantly, no hesitation. Boom, this is what I do for the queen and why she loves me. And then went on to play in character for a bit, even though he hadn't made a character sheet, right? Like that, like there's no pre-planning here. And it was hilarious to watch him after giving his little like initial boom, go, okay, now what? I'm like, that's it. Anyone have any more questions for Tori? And he's like, but what what are we playing right now is this the game no like this is the game you're you're, you're i'm not going to use that word because we're we're not explicit <laughs> here you're s and me like this can't be the game what is this what is this even what are we doing here and it just kept going around and like we're going around the table we're playing for the queen everyone's answering things and he starts even getting into asking other people questions and getting really into it but keeps like second guessing it like like this can't be it right like this isn't what you do and i'm like no this is the game and I think he finally got it when you get to, I don't know, is this a spoiler to say what the end of For the Queen is for people who haven't played it? To me, it kind of is. So we get to the final card. I, I won't spoil it just in case. We get to the final card, and I think he finally all soaked in. I, I got to say, it was it was fantastic. That was one of the best experiences I've had playing For the Queen. And 
it really showcased to me the power of that game. Yeah. And like we throw it on game recommendation episodes all the time. And I feel no guilt for throwing it on any recommendation list. Yeah, no. I, and to be fair, I have not played for the queen. Um, but at the same time, I have played a number of narrative RPGs. We gotta add that on the And list. I don't feel that I would be in any way uncomfortable just going in and rolling with it yeah. uh, because of, of my background. But it really is something that every trad player should be almost forced to play. Like, I, I have a feeling, get your trad player to play this, then masks, and it'll probably yeah. make more sense to them. No, absolutely. And yeah, one, one of the direct quotes to Anna's point was, are we creating characters right now? And I'm like, yes. For what, though? This is it. Like, like that's yep. basically, it's kind of a big game of character creation. But not. But it is. <laughs> But that's pretty much it for me. Um, we've still been super busy with appointments, sales, etc. Um, I unboxed a bunch of set stuff I talked about last week, and I still haven't even read the rules for anything I've unboxed in there. <laughs> Excuse me. Anything I unboxed in there besides size. So that's it for my last week of gaming. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? So honestly, I'm not sure. Um, we are getting together with Tori and Kat again, but this time, um, for the first time, ever really except for like going back to pre-covid on a saturday and we are actually doing a double date night and not just gaming though i'm sure there'll probably be some gaming going on that's not the focus of the evening um instead we're going to be out in a boot in essex county uh trying some local food and drink um basically highlighting tutorial cat places dan and i like to frequent sean's been to a couple of them now um the night's just as likely to end with rock band as azul so we'll have to see where that goes now, with them not coming over for our usual Friday night game, there's a chance Deanna and I will get some games in Friday night. But you know what? That's not set in stone. We'll see. Um, it's a chance for us to play games, but it's also a chance we might just sit back and like watch some movies or something. So at this point, you're just going to have to tune in next week and see what happened. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to uh, some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr., thank you for keeping our Discord at least somewhat active. Brian Kurtz, thanks, Brian. Jeff Seuss, loving the baby pics. Kevin Reno, thanks, Tech. Kat and Tori, uh, looking forward to Saturday and learning if Tori remembers anything about For the Queen at all. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop One Word, and on your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. You can show your support at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and help us to keep this show and our other content going. We'll be sure to throw you some awesome bonus content, including hours of bonus audio. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. And I invite you to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.